Christ's name. Amen. Okay. So, so for, for a long time now, we've been working on this verse to become people, men and women, who understand the times with knowledge of what Israel or the church needs to do. So tonight we're going to be trying to I lost my eraser. Trying to zoom in on the problem on the heart of the problem. So the, it, the Bible says, men and women who understand the times, the word understanding there is one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit, and with knowledge, the word knowledge is a specific kind of knowledge who, with knowledge of what needs to be done. Now, 2 Corinthians 2.12. 12 is a, a verse that is describing uh, Solomon, King David's son. 2 Chronicles. Sorry, 2 Chronicles 2.12. And we find a very interesting combination of words here. Then Huram, he's the king of Tyre, he sent a letter to Solomon and, and he says, because the Lord loves his people, he has made you king over them. Then Huram continued, blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, who has made heaven and earth, who has given King David a wise son endowed with discretion and understanding. This endowed with discretion and understanding is words used to describe men and women who understand the times with knowledge of what Israel should do. So in Hebrew, in English, it says endowed with. In Hebrew, it's the word knowledge. Now, we like to think of knowledge as being something that you can learn in school, learn in a book, factual knowledge. But this knowledge that God is talking about here means uh, an intimate understanding of. For example, the Bible says, uses this same word, it says, Adam knew his wife and she bore a son. It's, it's intimate It means that you have the ability to ascertain by seeing so it says knowledge with discretion discretion is our word sacal it means someone who has grown in understanding of the fear of the Lord. And then it has the word understanding. So the picture that it's giving us in, in Hebrew that makes it a little hard to understand maybe in in English, but I think we can understand it. It is a person who has made a choice 
who has chosen knowledge of God. And along with that knowledge of God, he has grown in the ability to discern, to use the various principles that the Bible teaches us through the fear of God so that, so that they are like a second nature to him or her. And they also have understanding. This understanding speaks about what happens to our mind when God transforms or renews our mind. Okay, now, I hope in just a second, all of this is going to become very clear to us. Why does our mind need to be transformed or renewed? Well, we know that, and the Bible teaches us that, our thinking, our reasoning was damaged, actually destroyed, by sin. And in salvation, God is returning back to us those things that were destroyed by sin. Knowledge, okay? Now, we're going to keep this idea of knowledge, and we're going to go a little farther in trying to understand what God means by knowledge. For example, Genesis 3, 5. In Genesis 3, 5, it says that God knows that in the day you eat, the day that you eat from the tree of knowledge and good and evil, that your eyes will be opened and you will be like God. So, God knows certain things. By the same Satan knows certain things. <clears throat> we have a tree of the knowledge of good and evil. We know that this is what Adam and Eve ate of for the first sin. So the question would become then, what is the different, what is the opposite of the knowledge of good and evil? Anybody want to make a guess? Because it's really important. What would be the opposite of the knowledge of good and evil? I'll help you a little bit. We can have knowledge of God or we can have knowledge of good and evil, but we can't do both. Knowledge of good and evil means that our senses are tuned to seeing God good and evil. Knowledge of God means that our senses are 
are tuned to, to understand spiritual things, the things of God. A person who has knowledge of good and evil, can they see the kingdom of heaven? Remember Jesus said to them in John chapter 3, until you're born again, you cannot even see the kingdom of heaven. When we are saved, when we are, let me use a different word. When we are born into the kingdom of God, we've talked about this many times, but I'm, I'm thinking you didn't catch the full meaning of it yet. Isaiah 11, 1 through 3. God gives to us, restores to us, seven gifts of the Holy Spirit that are, these seven gifts are the ability to once again go back and have knowledge of God and for our spiritual senses to be restored because our spiritual senses were destroyed when Adam and Eve chose knowledge of good and evil. This is a particular kind of knowledge. There's other kinds of knowledge. But this is the intimate knowledge This is fellowship. Kind of knowledge. When Adam and Eve chose knowledge of good and evil, they were, cho they were choosing to have that kind of knowledge of not only good and evil, but Satan. The Bible tells us that until we are born from above, who is our father? Satan is our father. We have to be adopted back into the kingdom of God. Knowledge. <coughs> now, in Jeremiah 3.15, as we looked at last week, the preachers after God's own heart feed us with knowledge But it's a different kind of knowledge. And Seikal, which is, Seikal is the beginning of sagacity. This knowledge is the knowledge that comes because our mind is being transformed or renewed. By God. Okay. Okay, so I'm gonna let's go to Proverbs two six. Proverbs chapter 2 is talking about wisdom. He starts out in, in verse 2. He says, make your ear attentive. He's talking about your ability to hear spiritually. Make your ear attentive incline your, to wisdom. Incline your heart for understanding. Seek strongly discernment. Use your voice to call for understanding. When you do these things, then you, in verse 5, then you will discern or understand the fear of the Lord and discover the knowledge of God. The knowledge of God. In Genesis, he talks about discovering or choosing the knowledge of good and evil. The 
They're opposites of each other. Okay, go ahead. But when we're saved, it doesn't mean that we lose our knowledge, practical knowledge of good and evil. I mean, God transforms it, us, but the knowledge that you have, it's still with you. That's it's right. Not, it's not like it's a clean slate. That's right. We, it's a process of, there's a whole long process that we have to go through to, to see what, to have undone what was done through sin. It's a whole long process. We call it sanctification. Yeah, but so it, I mean, it's, it never, it doesn't finish. Well, it, it will life. finish when we die yeah. and we're yeah. transformed. Yes. Yeah. But that's why, okay. that's why we've talked about Sekal, which is the beginnings of growing in the fear of the Lord. We talked about Sekal. They're, they're very similar words. This talks about one who's just starting. This talks about one who is becoming mature in. Right? Yeah. And the same process also works on the other side. Yeah. I mean, like, but when you say that you cannot have both, that's where I kind of... Yeah, you got to choose one or the other. Think about direction. Okay, which direction does this go? But which I mean, direction I mean, this goes? This other direction doesn't mean that you automatically, like, that's forgotten, that's gone. And you chose this. I mean, it stays with you anyway. That's right. It does. But the power of God then is 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 there to over, overcome. Now, I'll draw a little picture here. We come to a moment where we have to choose. We have many of these such moments in our life. We can choose this way. We can choose this way. One way takes us closer to God and to what God created us to be. One way pushes us farther and farther away from God. The same thing. We just and it's all, but it, but it has to do with, it has to do with what wisdom, what wisdom do you use when you're choosing? Now, in a minute, I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful that this is going to become clearer. Okay, so we talked about discovering the knowledge of God, Genesis 2.9, Genesis 2.17. Both talk about this question. In Genesis 2.9, well, 2.8 and 9, the Lord God planted a garden towards the east, the word Lord God there, we talked about it last year, so it's Yahweh Elohim. Yahweh Elohim is how God relates to men. Yahweh Elohim formed man of the dust from the ground, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. The Lord God, Yahweh Elohim, planted a garden towards the east in Eden. He put the man there. Yahweh Elohim in verse 9 caused to grow every tree that is pleasing to the sight and good for food. The tree also of life was in the midst of the garden. And then there's the knowledge of the, the, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You shouldn't have put it in there and you begin with it. It's so much okay. easier if they didn't have a choice. All right. So, great comment. Okay. Why did God put it there? Well, because... God gave to us 
free will so that we can make a choice. Okay? Now then, everybody likes this idea of free will. I don't believe in free will, I'm sorry. We do have it. But free will only exists when we choose the knowledge of God. When we choose knowledge of good and evil, the Bible tells us that when we sin, we become a slave of sin. So you have no free will. And you have lost your free will. The only free will that anybody has is when we choose the knowledge of God and choose to avoid, to reject the knowledge of good and evil. Every other, every other knowledge leads to slavery to sin. Okay. Now then, this is the really, really important part. And if you can catch this, then you go a long, long ways in becoming a person who understands the times with knowledge of what the church or in the Old Testament Israel needs to do. Okay, so in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve rejected knowledge of God and wisdom from above And they chose knowledge of good and evil, and they, they chose earthly, natural, demonic wisdom. Okay? That's why we call this the heart of the problem. Because all through the Old Testament and the New Testament, we see this exact battle going on time after time after time after time. Okay? Let's look at Jeremiah chapter 2. Yes, the heart of the problem of sin. No, is. Yes. The the yes, but we got to understand what is sin. Okay, Jeremiah chapter 2. This is an interesting chapter. The Bible tells us that Jeremiah started being a prophet. This is Jer Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 1. That Jeremiah became a prophet became a prophet in the days of Josiah. Josiah is famous because of the revival in Israel that occurred during Josiah's time. The revival was very short-lived. God gave the people a chance, but as we see in chapter two, they did not take advantage of the chance that God gave them. And very quickly as the revival went, they, they, they turned their backs on God. And so we have this prophecy that, was, that Jeremiah gives, and God tells him the, in chapter two, verse one, where it says, now the word of the Lord came to me, that is, the, the, in Hebrew, that's the word Yahweh. The word of Yahweh came to me, or Jehovah, if you prefer. It's the same name. Go and proclaim in the ears of Jerusalem, saying, I remember concerning you the devotion of your youth. So I re, I'm going to quote the NIV. The, I remember the devotion of your youth, 
how as a bride you loved me. Okay, so he's referring back to the time before Adam and Eve sinned. They had only the knowledge of God. They had only the wisdom from God. They had a love for God. And then in verse 5, thus says Yahweh, Jehovah, what injustice did your fathers find in me? Or what fault did your fathers find in me? Verse 6, they did not say, where is Yahweh? Verse 7, I brought you into a fruitful land to eat its good, to eat its fruit and good things. You came and defiled my land. Verse 8, the priest did not ask, where is Yahweh? Verse 13, you have forsaken me, the fountain of living water, to hew for yourself or carve for yourself cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. Verse 19, therefore see and no, therefore, know therefore and see that it is evil and bitter for you to forsake the Lord your God and the fear of me is not in you anymore. Okay, now, if you go back to Genesis chapter three and you look at the first 10 verses where it's talking about Adam and Eve sinning, Step by step, everything that God is accusing the people of in Jeremiah's day is what Adam and Eve did in the first sin. Everything. So, what fault did your fathers find in me? Verse, chapter 3, verse 1. Now the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field which the Yahweh Elohim, Jehovah Elohim had made. And he, Satan, said to the woman, indeed, as God said, you shall not eat from any tree of the garden. Yahweh Elohim made it. Yahweh Elohim spoke the word of God to them. Well, what does Satan do? He tries to find the word obscure obscure the personality of the living God. To make it uncertain. Yahweh Elohim, the God who made everything, the God who made us, the God who made the garden, the God that gave us life, is very specific. But he wants to obscure the personality of God, make it uncertain. He's, he's saying by the way that he speaks, indeed has Elohim, he said, you can't really know God. You can't really have knowledge of God. I'm obscuring for you so that you can't, so that you, and if you agree with me, you can't really know. You're hiding. You're trying to keep it from being seen. When you have clear knowledge of God, you can see that what Satan is doing, that he's lying. And when you obscure who God is, then the next two things that come in are distrust and 
doubt. You might recognize these as two of the first steps of leaving the holy fear of God, going into the unholy fear of God. Dismay comes next. What fault did your fathers find in me? What fault did Adam and Eve find in God? Because they had intimate, face-to-face -face knowledge of God. They were surrounded with the ways of God, the word of God. They had the wisdom that comes from above. What fault did Adam and Eve find in God? Well, the fault started when Satan obscures who God is. Then distrust and doubt come in. Okay. Think about when you first become a Christian, when you're first born into the kingdom of God. Can God really save me? Can God really keep his promises? The Bible says that when God begins a good work in us, he always finishes it. But what if he doesn't finish it in me? That's distrust and doubt that comes because our knowledge of God has been obscured by sin. That's important for huh? That's important for sure it is. That's what false teachers do. They obscure because they don't preach the God of the Bible. They don't like this God that is, his name is fear. They don't like the God that you must fear. They don't like the holy God. I'll never forget, I was preaching this in, uh, in, in Smolensk and asking the question, what, do, what fault did your fathers find in me? And Igor Fosliev, you remember him? He said, God is too holy. That is the fault that we found. And that is right. Okay, so what fault did your fathers find in me? God says to the children of Israel in, in Jeremiah's day, I led you to a fruitful land. Okay. <clears throat> God put them, Adam and Eve, in the Garden of Eden. Now the word Eden means luxurious living. The place of luxurious living. Interesting. It's pleasant. Soft. If you don't, we, rich living. That's what they had. They had luxurious, rich living. But Adam and Eve defiled the Garden of Eden just as the children of Israel defiled the promised land. In fact, Eden had to be destroyed because they had defiled it. Satan says, oh, if you follow me, I'm going to give you the whole world. You can be super rich with money. Why would I want to be super rich with money when I already have luxurious living, rich living? How does the Bible call this in the New Testament? Abundant life. Abundant life. I have come that they might have life and have it more abundantly. <clears throat> Where is the Lord? Where is Yahweh? Well, we've already talked about this. Satan on purpose chooses to ignore the name Yahweh when he's talking to Adam and Eve. And he gets Adam and Eve to start talking using his name for God. 
You have, where is the Lord? The God who does not have to be feared is an empty God. We talked about that last week, Baal and all the other gods. They're empty. There's nothing there. <clears throat> he says, you have forsaken me, the fountain, the source of living water. And what did Adam and Eve do? They forsake. The fear of the Lord. Look at Proverbs 14, 26, and 27. Proverbs 14, 26, and 27. The, the, the word yera. Okay, now, I forgot to say this. Knowledge of God is what happens when we have that year, that special kind of the fear of the Lord that speaks about the kind of relationship that Adam and Eve had with God when they had knowledge of God before they had knowledge of sin. So the Bible tells us that in this year, fear of the Lord, there is a strong confidence and his children will have refuge. This Garden of Eden had a boundary around it, a hedge of protection. The, the Yira, fear of the Lord, is a fountain of life that one may avoid the snares of death. Now, in the New Testament, the Bible tells us that God never allows us to be tempted more than we can withstand. God says, you have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters. And we, we see here that the fear of the Lord is that fountain that they forsook. This relationship, that's why God calls it spiritual adultery. They have broken the relationship with God. Verse 13 of Jeremiah chapter 17. Jeremiah 17 13, it talks about this. What does it mean to forsake me, the fountain of living waters? Jeremiah 17, 13. <clears throat> now in New American Standard, it reads, they have forsaken the fountain of living water, comma, even the Lord. You see that? Does everybody have New American or somebody have something else? They have forsaken the Lord, the fountain of living water. That is exactly how it reads in Hebrew. They have forsaken the Lord. They have forsaken Yahweh, who is the fountain of living water. When we forsake God, we are forsaking the relationship, this year of relationship that produces in us fountains of living water. Jesus talked about this in the New Testament. When we forsake the fountain of living water, forsake Yahweh, the fountain of living water, Isaiah 45, 20, <coughs> explains this to us, what happens. He says, gather yourselves together and come, draw near together, you fugitives of the nations who have no knowledge. It's this kind of knowledge. Who have no knowledge of God, who carry about their wooden idol and pray to a God who cannot save. Okay? They pray to a God. Now, praying to a God who cannot save is part of the damage 
done to our minds because of sin. And our minds have to be transformed or renewed by the power of God, by the fear of God. <clears throat> Verse 45, they have no knowledge of God. They only have knowledge of Satan. They only have knowledge of Satan's demonic, natural, earthly wisdom. And lastly, what did Adam and Eve do? Genesis 2 9, Jeremiah 2 9. This is what the people of God did in Jeremiah's day. It's what Adam and Eve did in their day. <coughs> Jeremiah 2 19. And this really is the heart of the problem. He said, Your own wickedness will correct you, and your apostasies will correct you. I'm sorry, your own wickedness will correct you your, and your own apostasies will reprove you. Know therefore and see that it is evil and bitter for you to forsake the Lord your God and the fear of me is not in you, declares Yahweh Elohim of hosts, the God of hosts. Now the word here in Isaiah and Jeremiah 2, 19, where it says dread, I'm sorry, some versions it says dread, some it says fear, is a very, very, very specific kind of the fear of God. This fear of God that is talking about here as used as a synonym for God's name. So you could say it would be accurate to speak of God as Yahweh Elohim. It would also be accurate to speak about God just using that one word fear there. That specific word fear is one of the names of God. Holy, God's name is holy. God's name is fear. This is the name of God. This is the fear of God that's most closely associated with the power of God's greatness and God's honor. Okay? Is this in here through the Isaac? Fear of Isaac. The, he swore by the... That's exactly the same word. Very specific word. Okay, so we got knowledge, relationship with God, Yira, knowledge, which is a relationship, intimate relationship. With good and evil. And we've I've given you the example several times of Adam and Eve raised Cain. He's their child. They loved him. Eve fed him at her breast. They cared for him gently. They loved him. And but through Cain. They had intimate knowledge of what it feels like, what it is like when your son you love murders your other son. The loss of a child. Okay? Relationship. Now, when we're speaking about this knowledge of God, relationship. There's three things there's, well there's three main things that we have to keep in mind. Number one, relationship with God. This is, the Bible calls this Yira, this special kind of the fear of God that describes those who have a relationship with God, but part of the fear of God. 
Next part of the fear of God that's included <coughs> in this relationship is the supremacy of God's word. We talked a little bit about that last week. How when God's word is no longer supreme, then we have already turned away from God. Now, what kind of knowledge of God's word did Adam and Eve have? Well, they had the knowledge of God that they saw through God's creation. They had the knowledge of God's word that God created for them a life of luxury and rich living called the God Garden of Eden. They had the knowledge of God's word as God created a helpmate for Adam. They had a knowledge of God from God's plan for their life. They had the spiritual senses, the ability to see and understand spiritual things that was destroyed through sin, that is, God restores through the Holy Spirit. This talks about our the way that we think. Remember, that's wisdom and understanding. The way that we act. We have counsel and strength. And then the relationship with God is understanding, I'm sorry, knowledge and the fear of the Lord, and then we're quick understanding in the things of God. So God's command to be fruitful and to fill the earth, God's command to subdue the earth or can control it and to rule over it are included in this. There is relationship with God, knowledge, but then there is also knowledge as it comes, to, as it come, as it stands to to know what God's word says, to know how to control the earth as God wants us to, or to subdue the earth. But this knowledge is like knowledge with a little K if you want it. This knowledge is a knowledge with a capital K. You cannot have this knowledge without this knowledge. Okay? This is number three. The spiritual senses, the knowledge that comes through that, all of that is, is part of, the, is three of the main parts of you. Now then, <clears throat> With, with Adam and Eve, what did Satan do? We're going to get to go into some little detail here. We've already talked about a little bit. <clears throat> Satan comes and he says, has God said? He's already saying, forget Yahweh. We're going to talk about just Elohim now, Satan says. When they forget Yahweh, they, in Jeremiah it says, they went far from me and they followed emptiness. They did not say, where is Yahweh? See, this would have been the time Satan comes and says, indeed has Elohim said, Adam and Eve should have said, are you talking about Yahweh Elohim? They forgot. They allowed themselves to be deceived. And so because of this, Satan obscures the personality of living God. He introduces uncertainty he said, you can't really know God.
when knowledge of when God is obscured, distrust and doubts come in, then dismay and discouragement, which are the first steps that come that we, we take when we turn away from the holy fear of God and begin to walk in the unholy fear of God. Now, what is the opposite of doubt? Faith. Doubt is the father of sin. Skepsis, skepticism, is the mother of all transgressions. Skepsis, skepticism, is malicious suspicion of God's love. Malicious suspicion of God's love. Doubt, skepsis, is the opposite of faith. And it is the malicious suspicion of God's love. Okay. God is so mean. He won't let you eat and have knowledge of good and evil. These things that God has prohibited just happen to be the most fun, best, most interesting things in all of creation. And God is so mean, he doesn't want you to have knowledge of good and evil. Okay. Now, let's go back just one more time and look at this, this tree here. Genesis chapter 2. Starting in verse 8, the Lord God, Yahweh, Elohim, planted a garden towards the east in Eden, a place of rich, luxurious living, and he placed the man whom he had formed there. Out of the ground, God caused to grow every tree that is pleasing. The word pleasing there is delightful beautiful, desirable, precious, pleasant, greatly beloved. Every tree that is pleasing to the sight, pleasing to look at, and good for food. It's not like there was one tree or five trees. In the past, I've, I've shared with you how my friend who was a Specialist in trees spoke about millions and millions and millions of trees. Every one of those trees was pleasing, delightful, rich, beautiful to the sight and good for food. Then there's, in English, there's a semicolon. There's a tree of life also in the midst of the garden. You see that? Does Satan ever talk about the tree of life? It's forgotten. Satan ever talk about all the millions and millions of pleasing trees? Nope. He talks about the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That's so man can have a choice. The only free choice a person has is choosing knowledge of God, choosing holiness, because choosing sin makes us a slave. And God says, you can't eat from that because... God knew that your eyes would be open. And Satan said, you shall not eat from any tree. We can, eat from all, we can eat from all the trees, but that one, verse four, Satan says, God will, God, you will not surely die. Even though God told them they would die, God said, you will not surely die. For God knows that in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be open.
God so mean? He is trying to deny you the one thing that can enlighten your mind. And one of the main ways that they push drugs onto to people is if you take this drug, you can have understanding. You can, your mind will be open. You will open your eyes to good and evil. And it did. For when our eyes are open to good and evil, it destroys at that same moment our, our spiritual senses. Because when our eyes are open to good and evil, the relationship with God is destroyed. In salvation, when God gives us the Holy Spirit, the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit are given to help restore the relationship, how we were before sin. It makes us, it destroys our spiritual senses. Our perception changes. How does our perception change? Death, cursings, seem attractive. If you eat from this, your eyes are going to be open. But in choosing that, you're choosing death. But that poison, clear liquid poison in a glass with ice, sweat, the, the water cond condensing on the glass, you're so hot and thirsty. Let me give a try of that glass of poison because it's cold and it's attractive looking. Our perception changes. We reject life and blessings. Now, in the Old Testament, God, and in the New Testament, Jesus, opens blind eyes physically. When God opens blind eyes, eyes that have been blinded, Physically, it's teaching us something spiritual. Mark 8, 17. We've talked about this before, but I want us to think about it one more time in the light of what we're talking about today. This is the disciples, the 12 disciples. They've been with Jesus for a long time. He's been trying to teach them something and they don't want to listen. They don't want to learn. In Mark 8, 17, Jesus they, was speaking about the bread of life. Verse 16, they began to talk with each other the fact that they have no physical bread. And Jesus, aware of this, said to them, Why do you discuss the fact that you have no bread? Do you not yet see or understand? Do you have a hardened heart? Having eyes, do you not see? Having ears, do you not hear? Do you not remember? Opening our eyes to the knowledge of good and evil destroys our ability to see and understand spiritually. The disciples had been with Christ for a while, but they still could not see and understand spiritual things. Spiritual blindness, hardness of heart go together. That we can know good and evil or we can know God. We can have God's wisdom, the pure holy wisdom that comes from above, or we can have the earthly natural demonic wisdom. And then Satan says, not only will your eyes be open, but you will have Satan. You will have some maturity in the, ab in the ability to do evil going to give you earthly, natural, demonic wisdom. We can have the knowledge of God. 
which includes multiplying, filling the earth, subduing the earth, controlling it, ruling over it, or we can have all the human knowledge that begins with the first sin. When we choose the fear of the Lord, when we begin to follow Christ, God begins that process of transforming minds and renewing hearts. Now, now then, we don't have time. We're going to talk about it next week. The heart of the problem is we do what Adam and Eve did. Now, when we're born from above, God gives us the Holy Spirit. We have the ability to, for our minds to be transformed and renewed. We're going to go into this more detail next week, but I just want to introduce you. It's called Failure to Thrive. I thought it maybe had an H in there. <laughs> THR. THR Thrive. Now I had to I had to observe court proceedings so that I could be certified to become CASA. The saddest case I ever heard, and the quickest case I ever saw where they denied a parental rights was on failure to thrive. The mother had a baby, beautiful little baby. She refused to feed the child. Now it was a hard child to feed. You could only feed a small amount of formula. Then you had to wait a certain period of time, feed it again, wait a certain time, feed it again. And the pediatrician called the police on the mother because of failure to thrive. The child wasn't growing. If you don't feed a child, it can't grow. She fed it enough to keep it from dying, but just bare. And if you continue in this way, the child would be permanently damaged for the rest of his life. They took the child away. They gave the child to some foster parents. And under the foster parents, within 10 days, the child immediately started to gain weight. Understand what I'm saying? Failure to thrive. Pastors, after God's own heart, feed God's people with Knowledge and understanding. When you're not fed with knowledge and understanding, we have failure to thrive. God gave them the ability, but there's nobody feeding them. Okay, now, if you're born into a church, if when you're born into the kingdom of God, God puts you in a church where they're feeding this, is it hard to grow? It is a little hard because you've got all of this confidence. But at least there's something there to help you. But if you're truly born again, born into the kingdom of God, and you're in a church where there is no feeding of knowledge and understanding, there will be a failure to thrive. We're going to talk about that more next week. <clears throat> human knowledge. Some call it human liberty. Human knowledge says you're free to sin. But in reality, it's bondage to sin. Free sex, free drugs, no laws, no limits. California, you can go into a store and steal up to 900 and some odd dollars worth of stuff. It's not against the law. What happens to society? It's destroyed. The businesses leave. They say, we can't keep this up. What happens to free sex? Families are destroyed. Free drugs. Lives are destroyed. 
Human knowledge says human liberty, freedom to sin. Take away the laws that limit our ability to sin because they want to have more and more knowledge of good and evil. Now, next thing. We will become like what we have knowledge of. If we have knowledge of God, we're going to become like God. What were they called in the Old Testament? God's chosen people. What are we called in the New Testament? Christians. Christians does not mean that I accept certain facts about God. It doesn't mean that I believe certain uh, doctrines about God. Christian means that my life is lived like Christ lived his life. We are becoming like Christ. Christ-like. <clears throat> My people, Christians, true liberty is fellowship with God. In the New Testament, Jesus says, he makes us free. If the Son has made you free, you are free indeed. We are free to return to what we were created to be. It says that when we are have knowledge of God, we become free from the law of sin and death. We become free from condemnation. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Okay? All right. I wish I could tell you that I wrote this next part. I'm actually quoting <clears throat> we talked about knowledge with a capital N we haven't got into I hope you understand a little bit of that then we have knowledge with a little K we have sin with a capital S we have little sin with a, with a, a sin with an S. The wages of sin is both its death, but we need to understand the relationship between them. Sin is things we do. Murder. I've never killed anybody. I'm not a sinner. Well, then I'm not a sinner. Adultery. I've never committed adultery, so I'm not a sinner. Uh, we could say lying. We could say drunkenness. We could say all of these lists. Stealing. I've never done these things. <clears throat> I'm not a sinner. I talked to a lady who worked in the Russian orphanage, and she said to me, honest, straight-faced, sincere as can be. Kenny, I have always kept the Ten Commandments. Never lied, never stolen, never done adultery, murder, etc. So great. About the commandment that says you have to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Well, I've never done this bad stuff, but have you done the positive thing? Well, no, I haven't. Martin Lloyd-Jones says, the real thing that makes sin, sin, is that there is an absence of the fear of the Lord. These things happen because there is 
no fear of the Lord. The Bible says, Know therefore and see that it is evil and bitter for you to forsake the Lord your God, and the fear of me is not in you. It's not that you did murder, adultery, not that you lied or stole. It is evil and bitter to forsake the Lord your God. We forsake the Lord our God when the fear of God is no longer in us. The thing that makes man a sinner is not a particular action. He is a sinner because the fear of the Lord is not in him. What makes a man a wicked sinner is that the fear of the Lord is not in him. Modern man has not realized that the essence of sin is that the fear of the Lord is not in them. Modern man has not realized that the essence of sin is that the fear of the Lord is not in them. In other words, the heart of the problem, the essence, the very core of the problem is the fear of the Lord is not in them. There is nothing of value, nothing internal, without the fear of the Lord. The lack of the fear of the Lord is the whole cause of all of today's troubles. The lack of the fear of the Lord is the whole cause of all of today's troubles. Men who understand the times with knowledge of what Israel should do. You have to understand where the root is. People say they want wisdom knowledge and understanding. We have education. We value education greatly. We want people to be educated. We go to college seeking wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. But we do not want the fear of the Lord that produces wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. We did not make the world. We did not make our, ourselves. God made everything. God made us so that the only way we can live and function properly is when we have the fear of the Lord. When we do not fear the Lord, then we have already forsaken the Lord our God. When the fear of the Lord is not the dominating principle of our lives, we have already greatly departed from God in God's ways. When the fear of the Lord is not the dominant principle of our church, then our church is already greatly departed from God. We cannot praise God without the fear of the Lord. We cannot worship God without the fear of the Lord. We are making a mockery of God's name. We are profaning God's name when we say we have praise and worship services without the fear of the Lord. We still glory from God when, we, when the fear of the Lord is not the dominating principle of our lives. If we're going to be men and women who understand the times with knowledge of what must be done, we have to understand what the heart of the problem is. The heart of the problem is we do exactly what Adam and Eve did when they rejected the knowledge of God and chose the knowledge of good and evil. They rejected the wisdom. Remember, Yira, that specific kind of the fear of the Lord, is the word the Bible uses to describe that relationship. And they chose relationship with good and evil and with Satan. They rejected a life of luxury and richness spiritual things to go for money, pleasure, all of these things that only produce death in the knowledge of good and evil. All right. Any questions? Okay. Well, if, if you have questions after listening to the the video, you can call me or you can send me an email. Be glad to help you. So let's pray. Father.